Hello everybody and welcome to Quiglet. Uh, this week we will be looking at Macbeth again as part of our exam success series and this lesson will be dedicated to themes. Some of the most important themes in the play, really important to understand and get to grips with. Before we begin though, it's important to understand what you can do with the materials in this lesson. How can they be of advantage to you as you head towards your examinations and to make sure that you are on track for a very successful response to William Shakespeare's Macbeth. There are a number of different ways. First way is to take notes. Make sure you're pausing the video as you go. Make sure you are uh, taking the notes in in your own speed and pace and time. Very important to make sure you get the very most out of this video itself. As well as this, use of mind maps. Create some very vivid, effective mind maps from this information you find. I find myself as a learner that I work very well on visual learning, so I love to create a mind map that's clear and effective of any notes I would receive either in a lesson or in a lecture later on. Um, and so that's one particular effective way of doing that as well. On top of this, consider it as a revision tool. Um, once you've taken these notes down, use it as a revision tool, either by yourself or with fellow classmates, with friends that you too know are studying Macbeth. It's a very, very effective way to go back over the notes and to make sure you're constantly retrieving that information as you head towards your examination. As well as this, use it to help annotate a copy of Macbeth if you do so happen to have one. Um, it's very useful. There'll be a number of quotes in this lesson today and you will be guided towards the specific scenes where you can find them. On top of that, use it as a method to list examples. Okay, so go back to yourself uh, with a sheet of paper and think of examples where uh, gender is an important theme in Macbeth or violence or the supernatural for example. These videos are here to be used in a number of different ways so make sure you get the very most out of the series itself. So we're going to start with the theme of the natural and the supernatural and I've deliberately put these two together because I find that they they do work together. Now we can't ignore the supernatural because at the very beginning, the play opens with the three witches, okay? They set the tone, they set the mood. Um, they are the ones that give the overarching atmosphere. Supernatural is so indelibly linked to the rest of the play in that regard. It allows the audience to distort the line between appearance and reality. Think of the different examples in the play, whether that is Macbeth hallucinating the dagger prior to Duncan's murder, or the phantom spot in the hand of Lady Macbeth in Act 5 as she sleepwalks. The supernatural blurs the lines between what is real and what is not real, and in doing so it creates a trauma for some of the characters, most notably our titular character Macbeth. Both parts, as I just mentioned, are closely connected. The natural and the supernatural impact each other. For instance, in the death of Duncan, we see that the natural world becomes corrupted and almost sick as a result. Now with this, not only does this lead to the destruction of the natural world, as I mentioned with Duncan, but in addition, it consumes Macbeth's mind. We look at the banquet scene, for example, where he hallucinates about seeing the ghost of Banquo, uh, we look at the prophecies, for example, that he's told in Act 4, as well as the original one with Banquo in Act 1. number of different ways that the supernatural becomes a huge part of what Macbeth sees and experiences in the play. It also allows us to question as a reader and the audience the idea of fate or free will. With the supernatural and the witches in Act 1 saying they're to meet with Macbeth, we as an audience can see that they're picking on Macbeth, they're deliberately targeting him. Now does that imply that it was fated for him to become king or instead have they just led him to believe that and he's chosen to take this path of destruction and tyranny by himself? Some examples of some of the most important scenes where this can be found are in the first scene, Act 1, Scene 1, you'll see there are numbered down, the meeting, um, our first meeting as an audience with the witches. In addition to this, Act 1, Scene 3, where Banquo and Macbeth both meet the witches and Act 4, Scene 1, the three prophecies where Macbeth is given some strength and confidence in his potential power as king, although not for long. Just three examples of many in the play. So here are some quotes for the natural and the supernatural that I find are really, really important. And I'm just going to give you a few um, words of advice on each of them. 
We start with the witches at Act 1, Scene 1. Fair is foul and foul is fair. We get this sense that they are there to corrupt the natural order, that those who are good will be destroyed and those who are evil will rise to the top that morality will be destroyed in the place of amorality and that really simple quick quote fair is foul and foul is fair is such an example. On top of this we have this quote from Macbeth where he says after um, the witch's prophecies about the Thane of Cawdor and becoming King of Scotland he says this supernatural soliciting cannot be ill cannot be good. We see that Macbeth is really ambivalent and undecided about this uh, prophecies he's just been received from the three witches on the one hand, he can see that they are very much to be taken with caution. But on the other hand, we also see that he is warming to them, that the supernatural is starting to have an impact on his own life in that regard. On top of this, we have Lady Macbeth calling to the supernatural. Come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here. Now later on, I'll get into more detail about the unsex part of that, that verb there. But this idea that she is almost leading an anti-prayer. She realizes that when she has received the letter from Macbeth about the witches and how he could become king, that she needs to conjure up darker, more sinister spirits in order to become the evil one that needs to do the deeds that will be done. On top of this, we see the quote, one of the most famous quotes that's been mentioned in previous videos on Gwiglet, is this a dagger I see before me? This hallucination, this sense of what's well, not all of a sudden real, is it there, is it not? This idea of violence, foreshadowing real violence, is very much seen in that quote. Now a quote here from a more minor character, and I think it's good to have a range of quotes, not just the ones that we more commonly come across, but the ones that are less considered. We see Ross commenting after the death of Duncan about how the natural world has been affected, and he says how tis said they, and in the closed bracket you'll see they're Duncan's horses, tis said they eat each other. Notice how the natural world seen in the example of the horses here is corrupted and has become destroyed and tainted. Um, they're doing something deeply unnatural because the king himself has died through unnatural causes. On top of this, Macbeth screaming and shouting at the ghost of Banquo in the banquet scene of Act 3, Scene 4. Thou canst not say I did it, never shake thy gory locks at me. This idea of the supernatural here come into play. Gory locks, the blood matted hair of Banquo we can see, though no one else can. And it shows how the supernatural ends up destroying minds, most specifically here in Macbeth. We now move on to violence and the theme of violence in the play really does shift in meaning from the beginning to its natural conclusion at the end. For example, at the very start of the play, Macbeth is actually praised for the violent actions he does in defense of the kingdom and defense of the realm of King Duncan. He is described by the captain in Act 1, Scene 2 of gruesomely and graphically slaying the people that betrayed Duncan and for that he is applauded. So violence isn't always seen as something bad. It's not always criticized in the play. In the case at the very beginning, it's actually commended. Macbeth is a hero. Macbeth is the good guy. You have to remember that. Violence, remember, comes as something natural to Macbeth. His natural role in the play is as a soldier. Remember, it becomes traumatizing to him later on Okay, when he murders Duncan, for example, he cannot go back into the bedchamber to put the bloody daggers back in the room where they should be. It becomes accepted by him, however, later on. He accepts the, an orders rather, the murder of children, for example, with the Macduffs in Act 4. Violence becomes something he first is disgusted by, and then he becomes um, more accepting of and more au fait with. Violence as a theme also is seen in the use of motivation. Lady Macbeth talks about how she would dash the brains out of a child to do what Macbeth could. It's also used to betray, Macdu uh, to betray Duncan under Macbeth's, uh, under Macbeth's roof. Uh, remember that it was bad enough that Duncan is murdered, but he's Dun uh, Duncan is murdered asleep in Macbeth's castle of Dunsinane, which is even worse. And it's also used to silence those Macbeth doesn't trust. Banquo obviously has seen the witches, so Macbeth does not trust him once he becomes king, and the Macduffs, having heard the prophecy in Act 4, he realises he can't trust them either. Violence is also seen in the demise of the two characters. Macbeth is decapitated as a traitor, 
as would be fit for a traitor's end once he is slain by Macduff, and Lady Macbeth takes her own life in suicide. So we see how violence is destructive to the very people that commit the greatest acts of violence in the play. This in turn, violence can be seen to usher in a new order and usher in an era of peace under King Malcolm. So while violence takes a very, very different approach throughout the progression of the play, it ultimately leads to peace. Okay, the slaying of Macbeth by Macduff allows King Malcolm to take the throne and peace to reign as is befitting a Shakespearean tragedy. Some examples of these scenes would be Act 1, Scene 2, where Macbeth is gloriously described by the captain from the battlefield. Act 2, Scene 2, with the murder of Duncan and Macbeth's trauma at doing a violent act. Remember, this is a man who is quoted as um, brutally, brutally slaying enemies, and to murder a man in his bed is too much, he uh, comes traumatised. Beyond this, Act 3, Scene 3, Banquo's murder is an important scene there, and Act 5, Scene 8, where Macduff defeats Macbeth. So what quotes have I picked for violence here that I think are particularly useful when you study this play? I begin with this from the captain in Act 1, Scene 2. He talks out, uh, he comments on how till he, Macbeth, again in closed brackets because he doesn't actually say that word, it just helps you to understand the context of the quote, unseamed him from the nave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. One of the most gruesome quotes when I teach my class about this, and you can really see the visceral imagery here. Unseamed, think of it like a, a stitching in, in, a, in, the, in a fabric of a jacket, for example, from the nave almost to the belly button to the chaps. Okay, we're almost disemboweling this gruesome, violent imagery and to fix his head upon our battlements, a quote that really shows Macbeth is au fait with and at an ease with violence in a way that becomes quite surprising later on. Lady Macbeth then mentions about how I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Notice how she's talking about an innocent child. She would take an innocent newborn baby and murder it so brutally to do what Macbeth is able to do, to gain the crown, as it were. Beyond this, Macbeth, we see his sense of trauma at violence. Will all great Neptune's ocean wash this hat, wash these hands clean, excuse me. He sees his blood caked hands and he can't imagine that the vastest oceans in the known universe can possibly wash it off. They see this horror and trauma in the man. Continuing on then, we actually see how much he's changed. Once he becomes king, he becomes numbed to violence. He becomes acclimatized to it. He says here, I am in blood steeped. It stepped in so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as Goa. He likens the blood of all the victims he has had killed or killed himself um, to that of almost like a pool or, an, or a lake or an ocean. And he imagines wading through that, that he can only get so far and it's almost like he'd have to go, it's easier for him to carry on than to go back in that regard. We then see in Act 4, Scene 1, how Macbeth um, commands soldiers to give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls, that of the Macduff family. Notice he's talking about murdering innocent women and children at this point, something that was deeply frowned upon then as much as it is now. And on top of that, we have this sense that Macbeth is willing to kill anyone to keep the crown. However, when Macbeth is surrounded, Macbeth is on the edge of defeat. He, we see the sense in Macbeth that he becomes a uh, more doomed, there's a doomed nobility to Macbeth. He says, blow wind, come rack, at least we will die with harness on our back. He has these quotes here that say effectively, if he is doomed, then he will go out fighting. There's kind of like a corrupted nobility in what he's saying. He wants a warrior's end. He wants to die a warrior, as he most certainly does. We then move on to the notion of kingship, something we talked about in lesson one, and please click through back to the videos if you need to watch again to make sure you consolidate your understanding. The idea of embodying these virtues and values of a king, or kingship as the term is, is deeply important in the play because we have three kings ultimately and their perceptions and the way they are perceived is very, very different as it goes. For example, Duncan is seen by Macbeth to personify the right qualities of a king. One of the greatest reasons Macbeth doesn't want to kill the king is because he's such a good king. Duncan is a virtuous and holy king, so he almost has no reason to murder him. 
In addition, when Macbeth becomes king, he realises he doesn't have these qualities and he, he's a man who's more paranoid now he is king and he descends into tyranny and this descent into becoming a tyrannical ruler is noted by many different characters um, how he is simply not fit to be king. Now, Malcolm initially fears he does not have the right qualities to be King of Scotland. Remember, Malcolm, the son of Duncan, is made Prince of Cumberland in Act 1, Scene 4, and he begins to suspect that perhaps he is not virtuous enough to become king. He's too greedy, he's too immoral to become the king, though he is eventually persuaded by Macduff. Remember, there is also a close connection between God and the king at this point. The king was seen as the physical manifestation of God, so we have this idea of the great chain of being, the idea of Duncan being king. So almost when Macbeth becomes king, it's like the devil has become king in that regard. Hence why um, in certain quotes he's referred to not only as a tyrant, but a hellhound as well. Some examples of scenes where this is particularly important will be Macbeth's description of Duncan in Act 1, Scene 7, Macduff persuading Malcolm in Act 4, Scene 3, and Macbeth being referred to as a tyrant in Act 3, Scene 6 by some of the lesser characters. So what quotes would I have picked out for kingship here? Well, there are a number of them, and I'll start with this. His virtues will plead like angels. Macbeth says this prior to plotting to kill Duncan, prior to, before, prior to the act being committed. Duncan's virtues will plead like angels. He has a long speech here where he says, Duncan is a holy man. Duncan is a good man. Why should I go about doing this? In addition, Malcolm says, but I have none, the king becoming graces. Malcolm believes that he does not have this idea of kingship. He is not fully versed in the ways of becoming a moral, upstanding, courageous king. Macduff, in the exact same scene, mentions about how with an untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred, Scotland is ruled. Notice this description of Macbeth, untitled tyrant, bloody sceptred, this idea of corruption, this idea of evil, this idea of a king who should not be king on the throne. We then have the quote I earlier mentioned in this same video, turn hellhound, turn where Macduff confronts Macbeth for that final battle. And we see here within this just how important it is that Macbeth, lacking all of the virtues of Duncan, has descended into becoming such an evil and despotic ruler. We then move on to gender and the presentation of gender and gender as a theme. Not only just the women and the men in the play, but also how they portray a perceived ascribed values of womanliness or manliness. For instance, there are strict expectations on gender at the time. We know this. Lady Macbeth, her name is literally an approximation and a reflection of the fact she is Macbeth's wife, Lady Macbeth. Okay, we never actually get a first name from her, that is her name. So we're already set up with the notion and the expectation of what gender is here, that a woman is a property and possession of the man. However, when she received the letter from Macbeth and she hears about the three witches, um, she says, unsex me here. Now, unsex is almost to rid herself, not just of femininity, but I would argue humanity. She knows she has to do things that humans would be horrified by. So when she says to come you mortal spirits, um, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts rather. When she says unsex me here, there's this idea of her removing, shedding humanity. I think it goes beyond that. I've heard a number of students in the 10 years I've been teaching say, well, she wants to be more like a man. Um, my argument there is, granted she wants to be less of a woman, but I think she wants to be less of a human altogether because she realizes and understands just how bad and just how depraved these acts she will have to commit are. Gender is also used as a tool of manipulation by Lady Macbeth. When Macbeth is erring on the side of caution, is becoming quite ambivalent and not really sure that he wants to actually commit to the act of murdering Duncan, she says, when you dust do it, then you were a man. The idea of him would only be a man if he commits the act itself, which actually stirs Macbeth into action. We also see different perspectives on masculinity here and what it is to be a man and how to act as a man. For example, Macbeth increasingly becomes cold and violent in the play, indifferent to the uh, ills and pains of others, ordering the deaths of women, of children, when he realises that his own wife takes her own life. He's very indifferent, very apathetic to it. There's almost no uh, love in this. 
This is compared to the more compassionate and humane presentation of masculinity seen in Macduff when Macduff learns that his family has died. He swears vengeance and he swears he will put Macbeth to the edge of his sword. However, he also acknowledges he has to grieve as well. He has to let his emotions out in order to fully grieve and mourn the loss of his family. There is also, I would argue, a third presentation of man as loving yet naive in Duncan. Duncan cannot see the treachery happening before him. Remember the first thing of Cawdor before Macbeth tries to betray him. He says there is no art in the uh, mind's eye to discover the construction of the face. A slightly paraphrased quote there, but what he's saying effectively and importantly is that, if in effect, um, he doesn't know who to trust. And there's an irony there because the one of the people he does trust in Macbeth is the person that ends up murdering him. Some examples of scenes here where gender is quite prevalent and important, I would argue, at one scene four, the scene where Duncan pronounces Malcolm the Prince of Cumberland, and he also has a lot of high praise for Macbeth, having returned from the battlefield. At one scene five of Lady Macbeth, where she uh, desires to shed her femininity and humanity, I would argue. We also have Macduff's grief in three, uh, act three, scene four. And Macbeth and his sort of grief, I would almost have that in inverted commas now, Act 5, Scene 5, because we don't really see much in terms of grief. Rather, we see a sort of cold indifference. So in terms of quotes for gender, we have the following, I would say, when you dust do it, then you were a man from Lady Macbeth, a much bigger part of a um, longer sequence there from Lady Macbeth. The idea of her playing on his ideas of not being a man. He responds to this, bring forth men, children only, that she should only have men or boys from that point onwards um, to fortify and steal their resolve, um, which brings him to action. Macduff, when he says, but I must also feel it as a man, the mourning and the loss of his wife and children, showing a compassionate side to masculinity there. In contrast, in direct and stark contrast to Macbeth's, she should have died hereafter. The first words he says upon learning that Lady Macbeth is dead. This idea here that well, she would die at some point anyway, or arguably that mm, she should, she um, had some of her time left to live. It was before her time. Notice the pronoun she there as well. It's very, very generic and very neutral. Um, this idea of she could be anybody almost. And I think there's a really a real importance in digging down into some of these quotes. And then we lead on to ambition as a theme. Now Macbeth begins the play as a soldier, so obviously he's in great stature, he's, a, he's someone of power and renown, he begins as a thane of Glam's, um, and in the court of Duncan he's highly revered, especially after helping to suppress the rebellion and the civil war. The witches, however, and Lady Macbeth help to act as catalysts for Macbeth's ambition. I believe that they stir his ambition and they ignite something that is a little bit more 50-50 before then. He's more conflicted. However, when, the, when these two sets of characters influence him, we see a more um, tangible sense of ambition. Banquo, in this exact same sense, I would argue acts as a foil or a counter to Macbeth's ambitions. Whereas Macbeth becomes more conflicted about the witch's prophecies in Act 1, Scene 3, Banquo is very cautionary. Banquo doesn't lead or believe much in them, so he keeps it at arm's length in that regard. Now his ambitions become all-consuming with Macbeth. These um, lead him to become king, lead him to become the most powerful person in the entire play. However, they also lead to his descent into paranoia and tyranny, slaying those he doesn't trust, slaying innocent people, as we mentioned before in the case of the Macduffs. To the point where he eventually cuts off Lady Macbeth. I think this is one of the pivotal plot points in the entire play. In Act 3, Scene 2, when he cuts her out, she does not know and she's not involved in the planned murder of Banquo, and he becomes increasingly isolated in order to keep that crown, which creates a division between them that is irreparably damaged. Some examples of scenes here would be Macbeth as Thane of Cawdor and Banquo, uh, when he finds out he's become Thane of Cawdor, and Banquo's reception and response to the witch's prophecies. We then see the indecision and manipulation of Macbeth by Lady Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 7, and Act 3, Scene 2, where Lady Macbeth is frozen out of the plot to consolidate the crown for Macbeth. So some quotes as far as ambition are concerned in the play. We have the following. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. Macbeth has a really important line here that can sometimes, quite often, be ignored. 
What he says here is that if he's going to become king, if the witch's prophecies are true and that he will ultimately become the king and the monarch of Scotland, well, he should just keep doing what he does. Why interfere in the natural course of human events? If he's going to become king, do nothing different. So we see actually at the beginning that while Macbeth may be ambitious, he's not going to go out of his way to change that. Banquo then refers to the instruments of darkness tell us truths. He has a cautionary note here. He says that he doesn't fully trust them, that they are not only unchristian but deeply supernatural and thus should be feared and treated with caution. Whereas Macbeth buys into the ideas a lot more. Now Macbeth is starting to warm up to the idea of, of overthrow and plotting to commit a moral act, particularly in Act 1, Scene 4, when he realises that Malcolm has made the heir to the throne. He says, stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. Black, deep desires, this idea of something impure, but very, very closely and internally and intensely hidden away. Now Lady Macbeth comments on Macbeth's own ambition. She says he is not without ambition. He does have ambition, but he is without the illness. Notice that word there, the illness should attend it, that he needs to think more sickly of these things. He needs to think more immorally. And this relates very importantly to the unsex me here quote from earlier, you know, becoming something not human, doing to do something that is very beyond the human pale. Macbeth, we then see a conflicted side to him prior to the murder of Duncan, how he comments on says, I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other side. He uses the metaphor of a horse rider um, to compare his ambition. The idea that he doesn't really have any reason to do it but apart from ambition itself to kill King Duncan. There's no reason bar that. And the ambition itself is um, problematic. The ambition itself is strained and could lead to more damage than he would wish to have. Then Macbeth comments on how to be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. We see this paranoia in him once he's become king and consolidated the crown and how Banquo himself is, is more afraid, he is more afraid of Banquo now. To be thus is nothing, to be king is nothing but to be safely king. We see this layer of now he has this ambition, he's Fear is to lose what he has gained. Then we have this really important quote here from Macbeth where he comments to Lady Macbeth after Lady Macbeth asks to what's to be done with Banquo. He says, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applauds the deed. He shuts her off. Notice how he says, be innocent of the knowledge. Don't get involved. Don't be a part of this. And then from that point on, she is not a part of any of the scheming and plans and plots of Macbeth. So that has been today's lesson and video. Thank you very much once again for clicking on Wiglet. And please leave a like. Please feel free to share this. And please subscribe as usual. And there will be another video up, as always, one video every Saturday going forwards. Until then, hope you're all very well. Have a great week. And take care. All the best. Bye-bye.